speaker today's uh, seminar, Creativity in Remote Work, How to Lead a Diverse Team. I would like to welcome today's dialogue speaker, Kato-san. Uh, please hand over, introduce yourself. Hey, thank you so much, Natsumi-san. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining our seminars. My name is Yasiki Kato. I'm a Chief Strategy Officer of Globis USA. Yeah. I also look forward to uh, listening to today's presentation. So uh, let me introduce today's great speaker. So next slide, please. Yeah, uh, he's uh, Darren. Uh, he is a faculty of our Grovis uh, University. And uh, okay, so uh, he brings his expertise in the private and public sectors to help individuals and organizations create value by more effectively collaborating, communicating, and creating remotely or across cultures. And so, as you can see, uh, he's been playing an active role in many different areas. So uh, without further ado, so I'd like to uh, invite Darren. So could you start uh, making a presentation? Great. Um, thank you, Kato-san, for that uh, great introduction. And hello, everyone. Good morning from Tokyo, where I am joining you from it's Friday now. <laughs> so over the next about 30 minutes or so, I will um, give you kind of a walkthrough about, again, this, you know, really important topic, timely topic, but very important topic about why creativity, of course, is so important um, in our work, but maybe um, more importantly, why it's something that is particularly, um, I say particularly beneficial for those of us working on remote teams or virtual teams, which is nowadays is pretty much all of us is pretty much most of us. Okay, now I'm having a little challenge with my slide sharing here. Let me try one more thing. See if Apple's going to cooperate with me here. It should. And as I was mentioned, you know, we will have time for Q and A um, at the end. So please um, look forward to. I look forward to your questions at the end. Okay, how's that? That's working great. Okay, there we go. So today's slides on, again, how to lead a diverse team. And again, that link between remote work, creativity and um, diversity. So question for the audience, just think about this yourself. Do you consider yourself to be creative? Yes or no? Um, do you think you are a creative person? Um, the reason I ask this is of course, um, a few several years ago, Adobe did a, a global survey, global creativity survey, and only 39% um, of um, respondents did describe themselves as being creative. 39%. Um, most of our companies and our work, our value is from our individual and group creativity. So that number is pretty low. So what is the percentage of people who are actually creative? It's more than 39%. <laughs> It's more than 50%, it's 100%. We are all creative. We, we may not think it, we may lack confidence in our creativity, but we are all creative. So it's important for us to get better at harnessing that creativity. Um, Sir Ken Robinson, um, who gave a TED talk on uh, creativity, and I think it's still one of the most watched TED talks of all time, made the point that we're all creative and creativity is a process. It's not something that just happens to some people. Sometimes everyone is creativity. Creativity is a process. And therefore, if creativity is a process, it's something that we can learn, we can practice, and we can get better at. So we're all creative. We just maybe not confident expressing it, but we can get better at it. And it's important also because as has been mentioned by the World Economic Forum back in 2020, creativity was seen as the third most in-demand job skill. And looking ahead a few years to 2025, the World Economic Forum still shows creativity, um, analytical, think analytical thinking, innovation. These are some of the most necessary job skills for the uh, current work environment and the near-term work environment. The reason for this is one reason for this, I should say, is we're seeing more and more the impact of AI and automation in the workplace. And the one thing that we can do much better than machines, than AI, is be creative. Um, AI is not quite at the point yet, and won't be for many decades, where it can outcreate a human. So creativity is our competitive advantage in the current and future workforce against 
AI. So a bit about me before we go into the subject. Um, again, I'm Darren. Hi, um, everyone. I'm from Toronto, Canada. Um, any Canadians here today? I don't know, but I grew up in Toronto and I went to the University of Toronto where I studied astrophysics, which is space. Worked in the government for many years in roles that were around innovation and helping startups in the Canadian innovation ecosystem and um, doing some business development work. Wanted to make a career change. So in 2010, I came here to Japan to get my MBA at Globus, where of course we want to get our MBAs. And uh, so I was a part-time MBA student at Globus. And since graduation, my day job has been leading global HR projects at um, Rico Company Limited, our global headquarters here in Tokyo, teaching at Globus, um, teaching design thinking um, as well with IDOU and writing on these topics of creativity, um, cross-cultural work, global teams for American business publications like Forbes and Fast Company. So this is a topic very near and dear to me from my professional background and from my passion because much of my success has been through working with such diverse global teams. So I mentioned the future. Um, AI is going to be um, having an impact and we should be more creative because creative is our advantage over AI. But we also want to look ahead to finally the world beyond um, COVID-19. And the, the workplace beyond COVID-19, as we know, it's pretty much going to be a hybrid or a remote workplace. This is a study that Slack did in uh, late um, 2020. And around the world, majority of people, you know, we have US, we have Japan in there as well. Most people want to work remotely. They want to work partly at home, partly in the office. Very few people around the world want to work at home only or at work only. So our workplace is global, it's virtual, and it's going to be impacted more and more by, by automation and by AI. So we put all these together. Um, you know, AI makes us more create, well, forces us to be more creative. Um, technology like Zoom means that we can shrink distances. And as technology gets better, language barriers will begin to fall as automation improves translation services. We're working in a remote environment. And you know, despite past trends, globalization, the trend is continuing. So because of all of this, in the future workplace, your colleagues, um, your customers, and your competitors, we often forget this, are going to be more global, are going to be more diverse because they're going to be global. So therefore, again, even more of a premium on creativity to be your differentiator individually and at your organizations. That's why, we are, want to talk about this topic today. Why is this important? So what? Well, it's because then we have to know how to work with diverse teams and particularly diverse global teams. And we have to then get better at understanding how to harness creativity in a remote work setting. We're very familiar, many of us, with maybe being creative and collaborative in a physical office, but we have to get better. There's no choice about doing this remotely because whether we're working hybrid or fully remote, um, remote work is a big part of our work um, life, our work world going forward. Therefore, understanding how to create remotely is, you know, is an imp is imperative for us to do. So how to do that? Um, first, let's talk about how to understand working on global teams and how to understand global diversity. Now, to begin this topic, I must apologize. I'm gonna have to ask you to do a quiz. It's quiz time. Now, this quiz is very simple. So don't worry about the quiz, very simple. Imagine someone says to you, you know, they give you their smartphone and they say, take my photo. What kind of photo would you take? If someone says take a photo of a person, would you take type A photo or a type B photo? Okay, that's something you don't need to think about this too quickly, but too much. So would you take type, type, type I? or type B photo. That's it, that's the quiz, very simple. Now, hold your answer in your mind because we're, we're going to come back to this in the discussion about, about culture. And when we're talking about culture, um, it's an important topic on global teams and on diverse global teams. What do we mean by culture? Well, there's lots of meanings of culture, definitions of culture, but the one I like to use is that it's basically the shared behaviors um, within people in a group. And everyone in that group knows it and practices these behaviors, often without even thinking about them. We often say that, you know, fish don't know that they're swimming in water. 
it's just natural for them. So we don't think about our culture so much because it's often natural to us. So culture is kind of how we do things around here. We don't think about it, we do it, it's just natural for us. And here can be a country, national culture, it can be a company, corporate culture, it can even be a team, team culture as well. So culture works at different levels. But we're focusing right now on looking at um, national culture because on global teams, we're dealing with diversity in national cultures as well. So culture seems like a very big, fuzzy, gray topic, hard to kind of measure, but there are ways that we can measure and uh, quantify culture. There are lots of frameworks um, for understanding culture. And the one I have found the most useful is um, in this book, um, The Culture Map, the framework from um, Aaron Meyer, an American teaching at INSEAD Business School. I found this to be the most pra practical for global business. And um, Professor Meyer came up with eight dimensions that we can use to measure a culture. Things like how do people communicate? How do they give feedback? How do they persuade? How do they build trust? How do they build relationships? Um, how they approach time? And so each com company or so each country we can evaluate on a spectrum, on a scale, on each of these eight different dimensions of culture. So if you look at communication, communication can be, at one end can be very low context, meaning high content. We use lots of words, we're very specific, we're very exact in what we say. At the other end of the scale, we have high context communication. Silence is important. There's lots of subtleties, nuances, unspoken communication is important. And so most countries and um, individuals, we fall somewhere along the spectrum. So let's begin by thinking about Japan. <laughs> probably you could guess on this, on this spectrum where you think Japan probably falls. And it's got, as you can guess, Japan falls pretty far to the right. Japan is a very high context communication culture. Um, and a company like a country like China is also somewhat high context as well. Now, if you look at, um, for example, English speaking countries, the UK is tends to be more towards the low context scale and the USA very much a low context communicator. So the point here is that um, these are generalizations. We're not, we're not saying, of course, everybody from these countries behaves this way, but generally speaking, US, UK, Chinese, Japanese culture is either very low context or high context. And you know, things are and they're relative. You know, a USA person might say, oh, that British person is very high context, very un, very subtle. The British person might say, oh, that Chinese coworker is very subtle, very unspoken, and so on and so on. So these things are all very relative. So these are ways you can understand different cultures. And what a culture map is, when we take these um, eight different dimensions and we plot where the countries fall on the eight dimensions. So for example, Japan, right? High context, very much around indirect negative feedback, hierarchical, et cetera. China is similar in some ways, but very different. China is very much about top-down decision-making. Japan very much consensus-based. There's a gap here, and I'll explain why in a minute. There's the UK and there is the US. So you can see already this is useful for us because if we had a global team, a virtual team of members from these countries, China, Japan, UK, US, you can see how national culture can influence the team's behavior and later how that influences uh, creativity and collaboration. So I mentioned there's a gap here. There's no scores for persuasion for Japan and China. Why is that? Well, that takes us back to our quiz from earlier. So I hope you remember your answer to this question, take a photo of a person. Which type of photo, A or B? This was a study that was done um, to groups of Americans and Japanese. And what was found is, generally speaking, Americans tended to take a photo like this, or said this is a photo of a person, whereas Japanese tended to take photos like this. What's going on here? Well, the, what was interesting is the Japanese said, this is not a photo of a person, it's a photo of a face. And the Americans said, this isn't a photo of a person, it's a photo of a room. So there is some culture at play here. And it's, it's what's called specific thinking versus holistic thinking. Whether you're thinking more about the thing, the face, the details, or holistically, the whole environment of the picture as well. So 
this is again very important for um, global virtual teams and for um, creativity because holistic thinking, which is common in East Asian cultures like Japan or China, um, relationships matter, connections between things matter, it's more group focused, and we begin talking about the macro, the big, before we build down to the micro. Whereas specific thinking, the things, the details matter more. It's more individual oriented and it's more common in, um, in Western cultures as well, as well. So why does this matter? Well, one thing is it matters how we persuade. If we think holistically, you may think holistically based on your answers to that survey, you're gonna persuade more about the big picture, about the environment, about the ecosystem, about the relationships. Whereas if you're focused, if you're persuading as a specific thinker, you're gonna persuade more on the details, on the specifics of the situation. So this is important because of course we could persuade in different ways and we can communicate and collaborate, maybe misunderstand each other if one person's communicating this way and one person's communicating this way, but there's a great benefit to this in terms of uh, communicate, uh, in terms of collaboration and creativity. And what that mean, what that is, is this is where diversity begins to come into it. If you have a team made up of holistic thinkers and specific thinkers, you're gonna have people who are thinking at different levels from different perspectives, and therefore you're gonna have multiple approaches to solving problems. So you're going to have these very complementary perspectives, which can boost creativity and avoid groupthink. When everyone thinks the same way, you're less creative. You're less likely to come up with new innovative solutions. But the more diverse you are by a global team, for example, which has holistic or specific thinkers, or any team which makes up holistic and specific thinkers, you're going to be more creative. You're going to have a more creative output. So I mentioned that um, countries can have culture maps, but what's more interesting is culture map of a global virtual team, how individuals will vary on these eight cultural dimensions. So what I'm showing you now is these are individual people's scores on the, day, on the eight cultural um, dimensions. So this person is more of a low context communicator, but it prefers hierarchical leadership. These are actual scores. So if we bring in the other members of this team, you get something that looks eventually like the Tokyo subway map. It's very colorful, lots of lines, but this is made up of about 20 individuals scores on the culture map. Now, if you use this as a member of or, or a leader of a virtual team with global members, you can already see a lot, you can already tell a lot about this team, its makeup, the diversity of this team, quite a range in how we communicate, but not so much maybe in how we persuade and tendency towards giving indirect negative feedback as opposed to direct negative feedback. So understanding this, using this culture map framework, you can learn a lot about yourself, you know, where do you fall here? But you can also learn a lot about your team and how your team behaves, how your team communicates and builds trust and um, views leadership, which can be very critical to leading a team that's virtual like this, where the members are remote and using this virtual team knowledge understand how to pull the creativity and harness the creativity that's inherent in the this team's diversity. So this is a bit hard to um, understand. So what we try to do is we just take the average of the scores, for example. So you'd have something like that, the average of all those 20 individual scores. And you could say for your team, this virtual team, this is your culture map, you know, a little bit tendency towards low communication, low context towards negative feedback, other things are more average. And if we bring in the outliers, the person who is the highest or the lowest score in each of the different categories, this is even more helpful in understanding how to lead your team and how to pull creativity out of your team because some of these elements have a particular impact on um, creativity. For example, uh, so, so really what we're talking about is not just creativity, but we've really been talking about diversity. So we often think of diversity in terms of, of course, gender, ethnicity, disability, um, LGBTQ, but what I'm showed you with that culture map is diversity in terms of how we think, cognitive diversity, how we behave and how we work. And th these aspects of diversity are again, very practical for us to understand as members and leaders of these teams to harness the creativity of our teams. So. What we're really showing you here is not so much a map of culture, it's a map of the, how the team's cognitive and behavioral diversity is. 
And these elements of diversity can have a huge impact on group creativity. So for example, how the team views leadership. If you are very hierarchical, have you a very hierarchical view of leadership, you respect hierarchy and seniority, in a meeting where the, where the boss is in the meeting, you probably will not speak up as much. You will not volunteer information. And that can have a negative impact on creativity. Whereas if you're very egalitarian of your, your view of leadership, you will speak up more. You will contribute more during meetings and discussions, which can help, help increase creativity uh, as well. And if you look at things like um, confrontation, now confrontation sounds like a negative thing, but it's not um, always. Um, personal confrontation, personal conflict is a negative thing. But when it comes to creativity, we want a bit of conflict and confrontation and disagreement because that's where new ideas come from. If we all avoid confrontation and we're all happy together, we're not going to be talking so much about new ideas. If we have more freedom to disagree, to um, um, be more, a little bit more open in our confrontations or disagreements with each other, we are more likely to generate new ideas. So these are some factors and how we build trust. The more, you, the more you trust your team, the more likely you are to have psychological safety, take risks and volunteer new ideas. So understanding how your team builds trust and building trust, whether it's relationship or around the work itself, you can build more trust on your team, therefore more psychological safety, more creativity, more innovation as well. So, you know, as all the research shows, diverse teams are more creative, particularly teams that are that are culturally or ethnically diverse. All the research has proven this point, they are more creative, but it takes more work to um, lead or manage such a team, as opposed to a team where everyone's from kind of the same cultural background. So the culture map helps you get to the stage where you can um, manage that diversity, understand the diversity and bring out the creativity in your team members as well. And again, already talked about this, understanding the specific elements of um, the team's diversity, particularly around hierarchical views of leadership and disagreement as well. So again, task conflict, disagreement about the work, a good thing. That's where we get new ideas from. But of course, we must avoid interpersonal conflict. That's something that we want to avoid, that's something that does not help with team, team um, creativity. But the culture map can help you with all of these things. So this is how we can understand a global team um, diversity, makeup, and from that, then how we can begin to um, harness the creativity inherent in a, uh, a global or multicultural team. How do we then bring in the remote work aspect? How do we harness creativity of remote teams? Well, um, one thing, other thing I'd like you to think about is where do you find yourself personally to be more creative on this, you know, on this scale? Do you tend to be more creative by yourself when you're working on deep focus? Um, are you more creative in groups where, you, where, where lots of energy? Um, each of us has our own preference about where we are, tend to be more creative. And this shows both time um, and place. Maybe you, don't, you haven't thought about this before so much, but this has a huge impact on how you contribute to a, um, a remote team, to a virtual team, because the team's um, work style may be based more or less on remote work or in office work or a mix, real time or not real time. And all of these things impact creativity on remote teams. And again, as I mentioned earlier, creativity is not, you know, it's not the iPod, it's not rocket science, it's not getting to the moon. Creativity is doing anything slightly better, 1% faster, 1% cheaper. That's creativity. It's something that we can all do by our own imagination. And it's influenced by our, our own individual creative output, whether that's as individuals or as teams, it's influenced by where we create, physical space as well as virtual space who we create with, I mentioned earlier, the virtual teams, um, or are we doing our creativity solo by ourselves? When we create with others, are we, or solo, are we creating in real time, synchronously, or are we being creative asynchronously, where we're working individually, not in real time? And of course, how we think intentionally about creativity. I mentioned earlier that creativity is a process, and often we don't plan it around that process. We don't think so intentionally about how to be creative, but there are some steps in the creative process that you can follow. And these can be very, um, these can be leveraged to be even more effective on a virtual team or a remote team. 
So creativity um, is best done through these cycles of what are called divergent thinking and convergent thinking. So divergent thinking is where we go for quantity of ideas. We just go crazy making, thinking of many, many ideas with no judgment. We don't say but in, to ourselves or in groups. We just create many choices, many ideas. That's called divergent thinking. That's the first phase of the creative process. Then after we've made a lot of ideas or we run out of ideas, then we begin to narrow down. We go into the convergent thinking. We apply some filters or criteria and we narrow down. So this shows how creativity can be a process. We go wide, we create many ideas, then we narrow down. We may, we may repeat this cycle multiple times. The reason why this is so important to separate it from this is we don't judge our ideas and therefore we don't cut our ideas yet. Um, as Linus Pauling, the double, uh, double Nobel laureate said, the best way to have good ideas is to begin with many ideas. So start by divergent thinking, going with many ideas. And we often try to create ideas, many ideas through brainstorming. Brainstorming is very common like this in office, but now of course we have to do a lot of our brainstorming remotely. And brainstorming, unfortunately, most brainstorming is not done very well. In fact, most creative uh, brainstorming fails because Usually the person who speaks up first or is the most aggressive or, or the boss, their ideas usually dominate traditional brainstorming. It isn't equal, it isn't fair to, to everyone. For particularly people who are maybe more introverted, who are more quiet or shy, who are not native speakers of the language, or just people who need time to think, these people don't do well in traditional brainstorming environments. So we're not getting ideas from everyone, from the diversity of our teams. And again, often people think brainstorming is about problem solving, but it's not. Brainstorming is about divergent thinking. It's about creating many ideas. And often we assume, like I saw showed in the picture, that brainstorming must be done together in real time. But that's not the case anymore. We do not need to brainstorm together, and we do not need to do it um, physically, but we also need to not do it in real time, particularly when we have global teams. You cannot do that. It's impossible to get everyone together at the same time zone on a global team, for example, as well. So a better way to create remotely is, of course, to understand your team's diversity and understand how that affects the brainstorming. But also, it's to embrace what's called um, asynchronous creativity. Creativity where we are creating as a team, but not together in real time. And we can do that by using something called brain writing, which is better than brainstorming. So first, asynchronous creativity. Um, what we're talking about really there is, of course, we can't get together in the remote teams, so there's no need to force us together to be creative. What we do is um, we leverage the diversity of the team. We recognize that everyone is not always best individually at getting together in groups to be creative. And so what we do is we create a virtual space, like a virtual whiteboard or a virtual um, Google Doc, a shared Google Doc, and we ask people to contribute ideas not in real time, individually. So there's people that need more time to think. They can spend the time they think to create better ideas and put them into the, um, the, the, the document, the whiteboard as well. Then later, maybe you get together as a group to do the, di the di uh, convergent thinking. But the point about remote teams, virtual teams and global teams is leverage technology that allows us to work collaboratively, not in real time and not in real space and allow the people who are not aggressive, who are not native speakers, who are not quick thinkers to contribute their ideas and therefore leverage the diversity of the team. And this is a process called a brain writing. Um, again, each person individually creates ideas at their own time. Maybe that's head down, private time, maybe it's in an office, whatever they're most comfortable. Everyone shares their ideas and then maybe everyone votes on the ideas. And anonymous helps because if the ideas are contributed anonymously, people are more likely to take a risk to speak up, to volunteer something that's maybe a bit more controversial or a bit more creative. And then after everyone submitted their ideas, you vote, you filter, you do the divergent thinking, and then you would maybe develop some of those ideas further through convergent and divergent thinking. So this is brain writing. It's not, it's using an online platform asynchronously with anonymous ideas, which will help the team feel comfortable, feel safe, and bring out all of their um, individual creativity, which again is inherent in any um, global um, uh, virtual team. So 
two minutes left. I can wrap up very easily in the next two minutes um, to bring everything together. I think these are the key points of what I've covered um, today. So again, um, AI, technology, globalization means that um, creativity is our differentiator and creativity working globally, working remotely is the norm going forward because that's who our, our coworkers, our collaborators and our competitors. Again, I always think about that, your competitors are gonna get better at this, are, are trying to be better at this. So therefore we have to get better at understanding um, how to work with diverse global teams or even diverse teams in your own country because I mentioned diversity before, cognitive behavioral um, work style, that is true in any team, even if everyone's from the same culture, the same country. There is diversity on a culture team where everyone's Japanese, where everyone's American, where everyone's Mexican, where everyone's Colombian. You have that diversity. So all teams have this element of diversity and therefore get better at harnessing the remote aspects of uh, creativity using things like brain writing um, and being creative more um, asynchronously as well. So um, that pretty much wraps up with me. There's my social media and website if you're interested in following me on LinkedIn or Twitter or my website. And uh, with that, I think I will turn it back over to um, Kato-san to begin our uh, conversation. So Kato-san, I'm over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, You're a great and enthusiastic presentation. So before moving on to our dialogue, so for our audience, uh, could you write your questions? in the chat box during our conversation. Yeah, so please feel free to put your questions in the chat box, yeah. Okay, so uh, let's start our dialogue, uh, Darren. Uh, okay, so, so my first question is, um, yeah, as you said, uh, maybe, well, of course we understand it's very important to be diverse mm. so that we can, uh, be creative. So, but once again, uh, could you explain why is it so important from your own experience? Yeah, so theoretically, maybe uh, yeah. all of us understand, but maybe I guess maybe you have your own experience. Yeah, Thank th th thanks, Katasan, for that great question. I mean, um, I'll answer in two ways. The first one is with my day job at RICO. Again, I'm leading these global project teams. Um, um, for, you know, we have 80, 85,000 employees. Those are the, the, our stakeholders. And so these global teams that I'm um, working with have um, RICO employees from around the world. And, and uh, they can range from maybe, you know, five or six up to, up to 20. But um, last year, um, we launched a, prog a project to create a new HR global award for recognizing our global um, HR employees and around the world. And I led that project and we intentionally made the team small and diverse. Mm -hmm. And um, so we had only six members, but they're from our, you know, we had from UK, from Japan, from US, uh, from Costa Rica, and I think um, also from, um, from Canada as well. And so we were a very small team and intentionally um, having the team had a national diversity, but also some people were, members were very young, some were very new, they're different levels of seniority. By structuring the team this way, I was amazed at the idea, the things that they came up with that we would never, it would never have occurred to me um, individually. So, you know, um, one person brought up the idea of, um, you know, do we want to, you know, you mentioned uh, Kokurazashi earlier at, at uh, Globus, you know, at RICO, we have our own uh, corporate philosophy around um, the RICO way. Um, you know, why don't we, um, uh, one of our RICO way legends is Gemba, the Japanese idea of Gemba, which is being at the workplace. Why don't we make a Gemba award for the person who shows the most Gemba in their, in their, in their HR? And um, most of us would never have thought about that individual, um, as a, individually in our own workplace, but this one member who was not Japanese, by the way, who was American, came up with this idea um, because they used the word Gemba quite a lot, which was surprising for us. We never knew that. So that's an example of how you know, we were able to create a more innovative um, HR award program from leveraging the uh, creativity of, of the individual members. So that's, you know, that would be one example um, as well. So I see that all the time um, leading these global mm -hmm. um, HR, HR projects at RICO. Um, and at Globus, I see it all the time. I see it, I saw it myself as a global student, of course, because of, um, as was shown in the video earlier, the, the, the classes are quite, um, are quite diverse. And the diversity came through really, um, not just by national background, but in terms of professional background. Yeah. So 
we had people who are again from you know I was back then I was in government so I was in the the, the public sector. Um, we had one discussion, and I think it might have been maybe in Nakamura-san's class, if I remember correctly, around personal values, and it was around, um, um, you know, what, why do we work? And I was the only one who was from the public sector there, and I said, I, I work because I want to help the population of Canada be more innovative and creative, and my, so my, my customers are 30 million Canadians, and my classmates were really surprised by that because they never thought about that. They were thinking of their customers as literally their customers, their stakeholders are quite different. So I think that was an example, one example as in my student days about how diversity, you know, how diver some diversity I brought to, to the group, to the class, able to contribute to the conversation to help my colleagues, classmates think a little bit differently as well. Thank you very much for your sharing your private and personal experience. And uh, maybe you've learned a lot from the diverse team. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so as to the content you've explained, uh, maybe you talked about the culture map and yep. uh, actually I'm a big fan of it and it's very oh, useful <laughs> yeah, yeah. to understand the each uh, people from uh, each countries. And, uh, but I'm afraid some of the participants might assume that the, like a culture map lead to a kind of a stereotype Mm -hmm. Such as, uh, yeah, Japanese people must be conservative like that. Right, right. Yeah. yeah so because different people have a different personality. Yeah. yeah. So my question is, well, how to balance the dealing with uh, culture map and with uh, personality? Yeah. Yeah. So this is um, one reason why I showed two kinds of culture maps, the, the country one and the team one. So mm -hmm. the country national culture maps, like I was saying, these are generalizations about national culture. I find they're very good at start, as a starting point. So for example, you know that your team is made by these people, maybe you're creating, creating a team for the first time. So whenever I, I launch a, a virtual team uh, at Rico, a global team, I have the team, I, I create one of these by knowing who is on the team, nationality, and it gives us a starting point as well. But that's only a starting point because, as you mentioned, everyone's individuals. Everybody does not reflect their national culture precisely. So that's why the culture map for the team itself, where everyone takes the culture map questionnaire, they get their own eight individual scores, that is much more useful because it's more realistic. It's more, it's more, like, it's more um, resonant with people's actual behaviors. And it's also surprising for them because they realize, you know, yes, I'm Canadian, but I'm not so stereotypically Canadian because I see my score change. I've been living in Japan for 11 years now. I see my, over the years I've been doing the survey, I see my, my communication shifting more high context over the years. So our environment changes us definitely um, as well. So yeah, it's, um, it's very uh, important to think about this as a starting point, the national culture maps, mm -hmm. recognizing in people are individuals. And as you get to know your team members or your customers, for example, or your business partners, um, you'll see how they are not reflective of their national cultures. The ideal again is on your team, you get them to create the culture, you create the culture map for your team yourself. And so the course we're talking about um, that I'm teaching, the innovation through virtual teams course, mm -hmm. I have all of the students create do the culture map survey. And in there, I create a culture map for the entire class. I show them that. And, uh, and they're working in five project teams. So I create a culture map for each of the project teams, which they can then use in their teams to understand because they are virtual teams, very diverse virtual teams, how they can then maybe manage their class, um, their group work, their behavior, their meetings, their collaborations, using that kind of class group culture map as well. Thank you very much. It's very uh, interesting and a very practical approach. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Maybe you've already talked about, but uh, talking about diversity, it mm -hmm. is said that the inclusion is also important. So yeah, to get to know each other as a yeah. team. Yeah, so maybe before starting our business uh, as a team, how should we uh, make the team inclusive? Yeah, uh, that's a great question because it, we have diversity, of course, and without inclusion, it's not going to be really helpful for anyone. And of course, that comes back to this question around uh, trust and psychological safety mm -hmm. I mentioned earlier as well. So if you're if you're launching a, a virtual team or you already have one, um, the trust building is, is vital. You know, 
when you when you have trust, then you have psychological safety. And if then you have psychological safety, then you're going to be able to harness the innovation. So you, a very practical example is again, I mentioned the culture map. One of the frameworks is um, is trust. And do you build trust? Um, is relationship building? And do you, and do you do it by building relationships? You could get to know the person individually, um, going out, having coffee, having a drink, small talk, or do you build trust around the work? I trust you because I know your professional background, your expertise. There's there's that scale. So understanding how individuals and the team builds trust um, it, using that kind of framework can, is, a, is very critical. That helps you be make people feel more safe um, and included. And I think I found this activity, this exercise of doing the culture map, it, it makes people feel more inclusive because they can see, here's me, here's how I fit into the team. Here's how I'm reflective or different or the same as my, as my colleagues as well. So, you know, the team leader, Organizations have a, have a uh, um, requirement, of course, to be inclusive, but often it falls down to the team leader to really turn that into, into action as well. So understanding how your team builds trust and building trust the right way um, that's, that's inclusive for all the different aspects of trust. So the people who are want trust from the relationships, building it that way, the people who build trust through the work, building trust that way as well. There's two kinds of trust. Um, in a, in a team, there's um, there's affective trust, emotional trust, and that often works better between on virtual teams. That works better between team leaders, and then there's trust in the work, and that often is better to come from uh, in in the, the trust from the, um, the team leader. That's often better to come from the team leader himself. So, if you have like a kind of if you have a team leader, the focus should be on showing trust in the people's professionalism, in their skills, and being more hands off. Amongst the team members, the balance of trust is on this emotional bonds as well. If you lead the team that way and you structure a team that way, you're going to have a team that has more trust and is more inclusive and therefore can harness that diversity as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And uh, trust or psychological safety is uh, key to maybe inclusive. And uh, thank you. And uh, one thing I'd like to know is maybe, of course, trust or safety is a keyword, but at the same time, I'm struggling with how to keep the team, uh, how to say, discipline, keep discipline, because uh, maybe being creative mm -hmm. sounds relaxed and uh, enjoyable, <laughs> but at the same time, maybe team has to follow some rule or regulation. Right. Yeah. So. For that, so as a leader, go, what, what should we consider? So this, this is this balance between um, mm. accountability and autonomy. It often, it often comes down to. So one, of the worst, so one of the worst things we can do on any remote team is to be, is to, um, you know, be like a, a more like a, trend, a micromanager, right? You cannot <laughs> do that with a remote team because you cannot see the people all the time, right? So, so how to, have, so um, back to your question, it, it comes down to giving people back to, it goes back to your previous question around trust. If you have a high trust environment, then you as a leader can give your team members the autonomy to work a little bit more independently as well, but they have to have accountability back mm -hmm. to you as well. So I trust you, I'm a team leader, I trust you to do the work, but here are your account, you're accountable for this, 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 these deliverables by, by this, this date as well. That's one way you can do it as well. Um, and talking about creativity and being fun, well, that's a good thing. It's, we wanna have fun when we work as well. Um, so, how, so how do you, um, you know, balance the, the, the fun, the creativity with the, the, the goals as well? Well, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I think you, you can do both. And by having this kind of balance between autonomy, autonomy and accountability, and one way you can do that is you can formalize that into a team agreement. This is what I often recommend is that, you know, we're a remote team. Here's our vision. Here's our goals. Here's our deliverables. And here's our, here's the way we're going to work. And here's how we're going to build trust. And everyone reads it and signs it. And that's kind of the contract on the, the virtual team. And that allows them to, um, allows you as a leader to, you know, show it to them later, trust them and say, hey, did you do this? Yes. Oh, you didn't. Well, why? And have a conversation around that as well. 
Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, I, I also think it's very important to uh, make some rule or promise yeah. at the beginning of the project work. That's thank a great you. word, promise, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so Natsumi-san, maybe uh, we have a lot of questions from the audiences. Yes, we have. Firstly, Daniel, who's your former classmate. Yes. <laughs> former student, uh, give yes. a very nice comment. He also. Thank you, Daniel. That's yeah. what I uh, question about does creativity have to be connected, uh, necessary with innovation from his from the beginning? In his view, creativity is an attitude or a way of mm. living. It may bring innovation occasionally, but it should not be restricted by some con concrete practical targets. How do you address there? So yeah, there's this is this big debate about is creativity a process or an outcome or a mindset. I think it's all of the above, and I think to Daniel's question around um, about innovation, innovation definitely is the output, and and creativity, um, you know, there's lot. It's it's. There's lots of aspects to it. So there's artistic creativity. Um, you know, S Susanna has a nice picture of the Starry Night from one there is a example. That's an example of creativity. But creativity also is creating a, a new mathematical theorem, or it's creating a new business model. Mm -hmm. um, there's lots of different aspects to to, to creativity. So I, I think to Daniel's question, um, or, or or maybe his his point as well, it's um. They're, they're not mutually exclusive. I think they are, they, they're both in, included in terms of um, um, creativity in, in, again, in a business context um, as well. It doesn't, ha doesn't have, always have to be around the business targets. It can be around um, how we work together as a team, for example, as well. How are we going to um, approach this problem? How are we going to um, communicate as a team? You know, it's creativity and how the team collaborates or, or, or works together as well. So I think there's many different aspects to, um, to a creativity. It doesn't always have to have a number attached to it um, as well, right? So I think that, I hope Daniel that answers your question or gets back to it. Okay, Carla also asked you a question. What kind of project or activities do you recommend to improve creativity in, uh, in her team members? Yeah, so um, this works best um, on tasks that are a bit vague, or not, not what I mean by vague is that um, it's a bit unclear how we're gonna approach the problem as well. Um, you don't, you know, for accounting or finance or computer program or coding, you know, probably you don't need to approach the, uh, do those problems this way. But if it's collaborative work where the, the, um, the problem is a bit ill-defined or fuzzy, that's where um, this kind of approach to creativity is where you're leveraging the individual insights of the team. That is where it is much more um, powerful. So, you know, we have to create a new uh, marketing a marketing program. We have to create a new, um, um, how, what's, what's an example? We have to create a new product for our users. We have to create a new um, program for our employees, like I said, HR, HR work program as well. These are all examples where um, these, are, these work much better for this kind of collaborative work that I've described than um, work that is a bit more um, uh, transactional, I suppose. It's a bit, a bit more heads down and, and administrative, for example, or you know, I, I had an example from my, my, my um, manage, one of the managers at Rico. She said, you know, you don't want people people who are repairing copiers to be creative because the parts have to fit together. <laughs> so, you know, that's where you don't want to have it, but you want to have it in maybe creating those parts, the design process, that's where the creativity comes out as well. Okay, very said yes, so. Okay, great. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Daniel also lays a very interesting question. Hybrid work is the most difficult to implement in comparison with only more or all on-site work should the choice mm. be left to work uh, himself or herself, or should there a system of rules put in a place to ensure fairness yeah. across the team? Very interesting. I want to know what you think. Yeah, this is like the question that we're that we're going through right now, right? Do we let employees decide, or does the company decide, or does the team decide when we come into the office? Um, but I think it, what it boils down to is it goes back to the, the point that Kata San made earlier about inclusion, right? Um, you have to find, um, so we talk about diversity and inclusion. We also talk about DEI and, um, and you know, equity and equality is important as well. You have to find a solution 
that works that recognizes individual persons situations so um you know um some people may have now have more um, parental duties and they have to work at home remotely um more so it really it's better to be inclusive and it's better to be fair right so ask individuals what their preference is and accommodate as much as possible but you know at some point you're going to have these hybrid meetings and so to help that fairness um when you have hybrid meetings when you have some members in the office and some members remote um to be fair you've got to it's you know people think it's silly but you've got to do this you can't have everyone in the meeting room together be talking and then isolating the people who are remote so if you have a hybrid meeting what you got to do is everyone's staring at their laptop even if they're in the office together you've got to make it fair for everyone and everyone talks to the laptop as well and when the meeting is over the people who are on in the office they don't all get together and talk about the meeting afterwards because that kind of excludes the people you so again you set this in the rules the communication team rules that we if we have hybrid meetings we will do it this way we will have everyone using the laptop ever looking at the camera and we will have no side meetings um for the people in person because it's not fair to the people who are working remotely as well so you do have some rules yes but the rules must be um to ensure fairness and equality for everyone who is um whether they're working in person or whether working remotely because if you don't do that you're going to build, reduce trust on your team and you're going to eventually break your team you're going to you're going to have two teams the people who work in the office the people who work remotely there's this thing um it challenge now it's called proximity bias and that's often managers or managers especially are more biased to the people who work in the office because they see them more often um and that's going to lead to maybe those people getting unfair career choice career benefits or promotions you've got to avoid that by built, having this more equitable um team um, hybrid environment and again making rules that say this is how we work when we're in hybrid meetings it's really vital to do it that way thank you it was very interesting how your opinion is is there anyone who would like to ask a question for Dylan if you have please put in the chat or Alicia Han Okay, so if you have uh, any questions, please put it in the chat. Oh, okay. okay, so yeah. Felipe, yes. mm -hmm. Felipe raised a question. Ah, As a great leader question. of a team, yeah. how can I inspire the use of creativity in my team? Great question, yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, and that, that word inspire um, is the key. So um, I mentioned earlier about the different kind of trust you have on, on a remote team. The, the 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 trust in the work for for the manager and the trust the emotional trust between me and mem members um this also affects leadership so um you have transactional leadership that's like the carrot and stick follow the rules do things or don't do things then you have transformative leadership which is more around um leading around the the, the team's vision or the benefits we're bringing to our customers or to our users or to whoever is the out the people who are getting output of our work um that is um i think um to answer the question that is the kind of thing that the leader of a team must to do is to focus more on um what is the vision of our work who are we helping and how does your work helping each people see how the output of their creativity is helping our our customers or our our users the people that we're working for um so employee engagement employees who um are the most engaged are those one of the things one of the reasons one of the criteria is um employees who can see how their work is having an impact are much more engaged we all want to help our customers or our users you know that's one reason we, that we work if you can see the impact that your work is having you are more engaged so for the team leader um helping your team um see the connection between the the vision the output of the company and how it's helping your users is very inspiring it's very motivating so making you know for example maybe to to lose this question bring bring your customers or team member or um customers or users of your work into a call once in a while make it make them into real people help motivate and inspire people by seeing having stories i love storytelling hearing stories of the impact that the work is having is very motivating very inspiring for um your your team and will help them you know again and linking that to creativity we created x 
look at the impact it's having. Here are some words from our customer, here's some testimonial, or here is our customer speaking. Um, that's really inspiring, really motivating to our team members to actually see the impact that they're having and the output of their creativity. And that will help them be, be more creative um, as well.